Good day, DFW. You're listening. You're watching the Dallas Fort Worth Business Podcast. I'm Aaron Spatz. Thank you so much for tuning in yet another week. So here we are. And I've gotten a few comments I wanted to just quickly share with you. The goal of this show is to probably produce two to three episodes per week. We're going to settle into more of a marathon based pace here. We came out the gate strong, wanted to really get out there, get going, and then we're going to kind of settle into race pace and, and keep it going. So we'd love to hear from you. If you have any comments, uh, drop me a line, podcast at boldmedia.us, whether that's guest guest suggestions, whether it's, hey, this this interview was phenomenal. It really meant a lot to me. It really impacted me you know, in a really big way. We'll, I'd love, love to hear about that. Uh, sponsorships, uh, we're, we're continuously uh, you know, entertaining and fielding uh, inquiries related to sponsorship. So if that's something that you or your company would like to learn more about, again, podcast at boldmedia.us. It's, it's pretty pretty straightforward. So we're going to jump right into this week's program. I'm uh, I'm super excited to welcome to the show Matt Fry. Matt is has had a, a career in fintech, and he's currently the founder and CEO of a company called Card Now. And Matt, I just want to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Aaron. I've been watching uh, lots of your interviews, man. I'm really, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 excited that you're here. So, it, so you'll probably know at this point now. I, I I love to lead off with with the famous question of where the heck are you originally from? Are you a DFW native or? I'm actually from Ohio, uh, Cleveland. So I'm a I'm a Browns fan living in DFW, which is an interesting sort of uh, juxtaposition. But uh, I've I've been in Texas. Uh, moved down here in the '80s. And I met my uh, my wife in Austin. Uh, we, we were going to school there, and uh, we've been in Dallas. Uh, this is like about five six years now, but it's like the third round in Dallas. So okay, in Plano for a little bit, Frisco, and then I, now we this recent stint, we actually live in the city. So oh man, that's terrific. Well, first about about the Cleveland area. So my my father, my my entire like father side of the family is from the Cleveland area, from Cuyahoga nice. County. So very good. Diehard Browns, Indians fans, uh, obviously the Cavs and all that. So, um, you know, they're, I'll tell you what, they put together a heck of a season this year. The Browns did. Right? I am very excited about what's, what's ahead. I've not been, you know, I've, you, you, I mean, no playoffs in so, you know, 30 years, it feels like, but, uh, <laughs> that was a good, that was a good season. Hopefully next year yeah. we'll keep, keep it going. Yeah. So before I lose too many viewers, just, just hang with me for a second. <laughs> okay. We're going to, we're going to, we're, we're going to talk about, no, well, like I want, want to talk football for just a second. So like, sure. what do you think, what do you think the Browns are going to do in terms of off season moves to get them better position for 2021? I think JJ Watt is going to sign with them. Oh man. Uh, I mean, that, that that's, a, that's a rumor and sort of a rumor in Cleveland that they'll, they'll pick him up. Um, and they'll, I mean, I think if they get o, OBJ back and he's playing now, now that, you know, they've, they've actually established the offense without him. I think that he could fit yeah. in as opposed to being sort of the diva. Um, and they, <laughs> they had so many injuries last year. I mean, even in the game against the Chiefs, you know, they were they were out a couple a couple defensive linemen and offensive linemen and one of the safeties. So, I mean, they have a, they, they have a really good good squad, I think. So Yeah. We'll, we'll have to wait and see when I lived in Houston. I was a big J.J. Watt fan, so it's crazy to see that he's going to be picking up a move, and we'll see. We'll see who gets him. So I guess we'll have to – I guess we'll just all have I to would, stay tuned. I would like that. <laughs> I would like that very much. So. <laughs> Well, hey, well, let's let's dive into your dive into your story. So you're you're a guy of many talents. You've uh, you've you've been through you know a ton of different businesses and lots of different ventures. And so I'd love to just kind of understand from you. I'm going to kind of ask you like a really open ended softball of a question. But you're like, what kind of got you started in business in terms of like the entrepreneurial bug? Because I'm seeing that as like a a little bit of a theme in your career. It I, like I realize it hasn't all been owner and founder but a lot of it has there's been there's been a pretty mixed yep. bag of things that you've done so like where where did that come from like where was that birthed so you know the early early part of my life i was in the restaurant business i actually was you know i bartended through um through most of college and then um one, one of my primary business partners uh, he was my roommate and we bartended together um nice. and we sort of got into the the fintech business you know very early on through doing uh, like ATM processing and sort of uh, selling uh, credit card services and things like that. That's how we sort of learned it. But the early days being in the restaurant business, um, you know, just having to shoot from the hip all the time and sort of uh, this chaotic sort of environment that happens on a, on a Friday night or a Saturday night and yeah. to be able to get through it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to replicate that in a cube. It's hard to, hard to replicate that in a traditional business setting. So, you know, putting yourself uh, on out on the edge and, and, you know, being an entrepreneur, putting maybe your own equity at risk 
certainly putting reputation and, and um, you know, sort of livelihood at risk. It's, it, it gives you that same sort of feeling. Uh, and I'm, and then I, I never really knew this early on when I started, started to get into FinTech, I really like to build stuff. Um, I don't know where that, I don't know if that sort of comes from the same uh, desire for the sort of the high of, of, of building, of, of building businesses, but I actually like building product. I like, I like uh, yeah. creating new services or stitching things together in ways that other people hadn't in the past. And so I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm dangerous enough to, to be in the technology realm uh, and sort of uh, be part of the dev team and, and drive engineering and, and certainly uh, the product of the marketing pieces. So all the hats together, you know, I'm able to influence whether it's something that I'm doing myself or whether I'm part of a bigger team. I really like to be able to see the end result. And sometimes if you're just mired in a, a really large corporation and you're just, you know, one of the, one of the many cogs, it's hard to, to see what you're actually working on, definitely not see it come to fruition. Um, so m my career, I would usually end up uh, part of a smaller company, get swallowed up by a bigger guy and last not too long uh, and, and get frustrated with not being able to see things to the end and then go back small again. Uh, so that's typically been my career. That's interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, like you're, you mentioned being a builder and so, it, the way that I interpret that is it, and not like not just the product, but like you enjoy the thrill and the challenge, I think, of having to create something and you know, get it out to market, see what you see how the market receives it. You know, what what kind of development strategies do, you know, do we have? Watch it grow and then go do something else and kind of start that process over. So to me, I, again, I could be I could be way off on this, but just hearing you talk, it sounds like for you to stay somewhere for a super long period of time to keep sustaining it forever would probably, you probably get a little disinterested or bored with it after a while. You want to, you're constantly looking for a new challenge. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. I, I like, I like challenge. I like to be, I like to solve problems and yeah. sometimes you solve a problem, you work yourself out of that, out of that <laughs> sort of environment. And yeah. um, I mean, I've been lucky enough. There've been uh, quite a few uh, roles where I've been, uh, asked to to lead change within an organization or, or help merge merge companies or sort of be on the front line of, of, of acquisitions and things like that. So that would definitely you know, keep you keeps things fresh. Um, okay. But but then you're sort of doing it for somebody else. And so that that also loses its luster after a while. Right. And you want to try to do it on your own. For sure. For sure. No, I totally understand that. The uh, let's let's dive real quickly into just fintech. So for for those like myself who are not obviously uh, you know as well versed in in this industry and technology the way that what i hear you describing it is you know, fintech being the the backbone of how it, the way that you described it was a lot of like the payment processing portions of business transactions is that right correct and okay. you know it used to be the guts behind the scenes of you know banking infrastructure and and uh, credit card processing the, the the sort of the pipes that were required to do stuff like that, but now it's it's a product business. Uh, you're you're building consumer facing tech that is that that you're sort of exposing the guts and, and making it fun to interact with it. I mean, I, I you know Robinhood has got some bad rep lately, but yeah. but stuff like that and just sort of enabling retail trading at uh, at a scale like that. Who would have thought that 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 would even be possible? But they sort of you know, turn these trading platforms into into sort of exposed services that can be embedded in things like like uh, like apps and other banking services. And it's uh, it's I, I I'm still thrilled every time I see somebody turn what is sort of a mundane back end service into a, a, a consumer oriented uh, value prop. And uh, there's still, you know, uh, how you insurance companies, there's insure tech and mortgage tech and fintech and there's 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 all these texts that are lining up to yeah. sort of revolutionize what is what is mostly owned by big banks and sort of part of their revenue stream, but now sort of democratizing it out to smaller players to be able to use sure. it. Well, yeah, I mean, it, and you hit on a good point there too, is because let's just be real, it doesn't sound like it's the most interesting and exciting journey to be on in terms of like, okay, you know, I I want this payment uh, again. I'm being an outsider to the industry, I'm going to sound like such an idiot when I'm trying to describe this, but you know, like you're trying to get a payment process from maybe a, a point of sale system and the whole journey that that, you know, that all that goes through in order to get to your bank account. There's a lot of, a lot of hops. There's a lot of places where 
things are having to happen behind the scenes. And so yep. a lot of what you're doing is not very glamorous, right? But it's very, very vital in, in order for business and for commerce to continue to happen. And so it like, let's go back then to a little bit more towards the start. So you and your, so you said you and your roommate were bartending together, which I think is awesome by the way, but then you, uh, but then you're, you're moving more into, into FinTech. So you guys got exposed to that. Tell me then like your first couple stops, into the industry and, and what you learned and where and where you were starting to take take some of this technology. The first the first real business that uh, that I got into out of the restaurant business. So I, I ended up owning a restaurant in Oklahoma, um, and you know I literally left the restaurant and then worked for this uh, bill payment company in uh, okay. San San Antonio. Um, so we were doing this is back in the late nineties. We were doing bill payment transactions from, from home banking sites. So, you know, back when you were, everybody still wrote checks, there were a few home banking sites where you could actually, you know, pay your bill directly. But m much like what I was just talking about, where we're, you know, FinTech sort of exposed this, these services, still behind the scenes, it still is, it's, it's ugly. So most of those services where you're doing bill pay, they're still writing checks. They're just writing drafts off of your account and, and it still shows up in a lockbox. Um, for somebody to process. So it's not any faster. It's maybe easier for you because you don't have to write the check. But we were trying to we were trying to connect the two together though. So we would work with the billers to create electronic connections to these aggregators that had all the, the, the home banking sites. And instead of more of these drafts showing up at the lockbox, we could we could settle electronically and, and with remittance data electronically. And wow. so that was my first exposure to you know sort of on scale. Um, and I went back and got my MBA and I became a, I was a product manager, sort of got, learned through, you know, responding to RFPs and um, I mean, sort of building out a, a, a set of broad product documentation sort of in response to these RFPs that we were doing for all these businesses, all these billers that were looking for services like we offered. Um, and then, you know, one thing led to another and sort of got exposed to the partners that we worked with and okay. got, got to work with them more and sort of understood more of you know the upstream of these payments and the downstream of them and you know all the other participants in the chain and ended up working at uh, another bill pay company in uh, in New Jersey for a little bit we got that sold and that that's sort of started that process so where I work for a company that we sold that I would take that experience and move to something else and uh, I worked for uh, bank one here in Dallas for a couple of years where we were trying to build our own bill pay services for our own treasury clients. Um, uh -huh. And then Chase bought bank one. And then I used that to spin it into another, uh, another opportunity. And um, I, the, what set me off into the, the card now business that I have today, uh, we started uh, my partner and I, uh, who, who we, we go back and forth, like, He'll go uh, somewhere and I'll, I'll follow or I'll go somewhere and then he'll follow. Awesome, um, there was this at point back in uh, 2005, 2006, we started a company called Pay Junior. Okay. And Pay Junior, it was a little bit ahead of its time. It was before the iPhone. Um, but we had a chore and allowance management system for parents oh, wow. to, uh, to manage you know, what the kids earned based on what they would do. And then we had a, a prepaid card. So this is before prepaid cards were sort of as, as, as mainstay as there are now with all the different use cases. But back then we had a visa bucks card. So visa had a, a program specifically for, for, for teens. Um, and then we had a target card for kids that were under, under 13. And we were, you could push parents could push money based on chores being done, but it was all online. Um, the app, there are a couple providers now that are doing it really well today um, with, with those kinds of programs. Um, and the app certainly helps executing that. Sure. But while we were doing that business, we had we found a little widget with uh, a, we found a vendor in, in the UK that was doing software where you could upload pictures to the face of the of the credit card. So we were handing out prepaid cards to teenagers, and then we'd allowed them to put whatever picture they wanted on the front of it. So the logo of their favorite team, or uh, maybe okay. that their, them and their friends at the at the baseball game, or whatever. And then that's what we turned into a gift card business. Um, it was that little widget that we found. Corporates wanted to upload their logos. People wanted to put family pictures and hand out gift cards with uh, with for more custom feel as opposed to just the silver Visa card that you can buy at the grocery store. 
Um, so we pivoted, we turned away from pay junior, turned it into a gift card business. Um, that's what we ended up selling to Blackhawk network back in uh, 2014. And that's how I learned the retail gift card business. And that's what card now sort of is. So wow. there's, there's a bunch of stops in the middle there. Um, yeah. I worked at visa for a couple of years, worked at, uh, a prepaid processor, uh, down in Jacksonville, Florida for a couple of years. We sold that to us bank. Um, and I worked at a, a check guarantee company that mobile, you take a picture of your check and literally cash checks over your phone, not just the mobile deposit that we do yeah. um, where, but actually like guarantee and cash a check and have it, have the money pushed to your, uh, your prepaid card. We were doing, doing that in a company in Atlanta for a while. Um, so I, I popped all over the place, but you know, always, parlaying whatever I've learned into something else and taking and taking the relationship with me. And, um, you know, usually there's, there's a, there's a network of people that have been in FinTech for a while that, uh, and you can leverage, you know, there's always somebody you can call to solve a problem, especially sure. if, you, if you've been doing it for as, as long as I have. Wow. No, I mean, like you've got, I mean, you've got a ton of different, you know, different experiences and the way it's gone and, and, and not just that, but also seeing the way that, uh, you know, that, that a company would be, purchased right and so going through the the uh the acquisition process so like i mean going back to just picking on say like giftcard.com so you i mean you so you were founder there so that we bought that right so that okay. when we had pay junior and we pivoted to card lab was the name of the company that we pivoted to okay um because you know the lab we had the sort of just this animated videos of you you know uh, putting the card through this little, like, like when you paint your car, uh, you think of the me mechanics around painting cars and, and the car going through that you, yeah. you building your building your card design and sort of a I lab see. to build the car. But giftcard.com was uh, the, the guys just had the domain and they, um, they were, they were trying to find somebody to buy it. And when we had card lab, it mm -hmm. made sense. So we bought that domain and we were selling our custom gift cards on gift card, gift card.com and gift 1-800 gift card. And, um, there were, we had lots of properties where we we're sort of parlaying volume and traffic into sales and sort of finding new audiences and the, the B2B part of it selling to businesses was really the most attractive thing to, to Blackhawk. Um, when they came along, they were looking for incentive card solutions and platforms. And we had a, we had a really cool widget that they wanted. So. Wow. So then you, so then you, you sold that and like you, you guys were bought out from that experience and then you just then you just moved on to the next thing i you know i stayed at blackhawk for for like three years so that's but that's a probably the most enjoyable three-year stint as i was mentioning before that that was the job where i was able to uh, be on the front line of many other acquisitions so we were our company was the second purchase that blackhawk made I see. In in about uh, about a six month period, and then over the next three years, they made another fifteen purchases. Holy cow! And yeah. and I was I was involved in almost all of them. It was it's a lot it was a lot of fun. Okay, so then let so let's so let's let's pivot there. So talk talk me through what made the companies that were purchased. What what elements about them would make them an attractive target? And so like what what were things that you were looking for when you're when you're kind of looking at different opportunities you know the number we were, were public company so the number one thing is to looking for a creative ebitda because we were you know sort of on this on this treadmill of turning out really good earnings and we had to continue that um but that the blackhawk business is it's a you think the racks that you see at the grocery store or cvs with all the gift cards that's Blackhawk is that they do that. Okay. That's their core business. And so they have this huge catalog of content and they distribute it in retail like you see, but they also distribute it digitally for, uh, for incentive programs. So you trade in your miles for gift cards, your points for gift cards. Um, you uh, fill out a survey and you get a gift card, things like that. These are, these are other delivery mechanisms for that same catalog. So we were always okay. looking for, other platforms that that needed that content and we would vertically sort of wedge ourselves into those markets by buying a platform that did the delivery so you know we were we were able to feed that platform our own content so there was it's a, it's a creative because there's more volume yeah. but then also 
sort of establish a, a beachhead in what potentially was uh, sort of an emerging competitive landscape on on the on the platform side. So rebate platforms and uh, channel incentive platforms that that incent salespeople and manufacturers incenting incenting retailers. You know all those 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 platforms exist and they all, they need that value. They need that, that, uh, whatever that reward is going to be, um, uh, employee recognition platforms where, um, the HR managers are, are looking for ways to motivate staff. And, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to deliver that, but usually at the end, there is a reward of some kind, you know, trading in points for a gift card. So we, we bought all of those. We bought employee platforms, rebate platforms, uh, uh, incentive platforms, and, you know, all, all along, there was more volume as a result, but then it also just became more to manage more stuff yeah. that we weren't necessarily great at. Okay. Um, and it, it took a toll and we, we ended up with, and, and, and I mean, there's, they're still out there. I mean, Blackhawk, the reason I left was because we got, we got bought. So oh, Blackhawk, wow. okay. Silver, Silver Lake is a huge private equity. Uh, they actually took Blackhawk private. And then that was in uh, 2018, I think. Um, so it's been a couple of years now and they're in the midst of trying to really finish the integrations of some of those, some of those platforms. And, and there's still a ton of synergies that they can get out of that, out of that business. And then, you know, they'll flip it and do it, do something else with it. But that was a big, that was like $4 billion. That was a big number. Holy cow. Um, Silver Lake is, you know, they're big. They, I think Silver Lake owns, uh, the majority of EMC and Dell and they own like ancestry.com and a bunch of other, some you know, big, big, uh, enterprises. And so this was, a this was a different for them, but perfect fit because it was, we had all of this bloat and, you know, technical debt, if you want to call it that, that really could be unified. And, but we just, we needed time to do it and being listed on NASDAQ just does not give you time to do it. So Silver Lake smartly looked at it and said, there's a lot more value here. And so let's take it, let's fix it. Let's do some things for the next two, three, four years, you know, however long they, they maybe they'll do it for another couple probably. And then they'll maybe sell it in pieces or spit it out wow. again in public or something. Yeah. I, I mean, I, like, I, I guess I just, I didn't realize there's so many different bits and pieces to this entire, to this entire industry. Like there's, there's a ton of, like, as you're describing, like the rebates and you know, the payments and employee recognition and customization. And like, there's just, and that's just, I mean, we're just scratching the very top of this and there's just, there's so, so, so much that, that goes into all that. So, yep. yeah, I mean, that's absolutely insane. I'd, I'd love to hear more. And, and I think it's a great, great pause point here, but you know, when we come back from break, I like to just kind of, again, kind of rewind, zoom out for just a second and then zoom back in. And take us through the journey of a dollar, uh, like electronically, like as we're as someone like pro goes to process a payment, whether it's through like I don't know, you're paying your water bill with the city, or you're paying I don't know a car payment or something. I, I have no idea, but like if, if you have like I've got a good example. Yeah, we can. Okay, we can all right. Through. Okay, yeah, all right. So let's so let's 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 walk through it because I think it it help those of us that aren't experts or really well versed in this industry kind of understand all the different things are going on behind the scenes. Cause we just take it all for granted. I mean, I right. mean, really, we just take it all for granted. So anyway, we'll, we'll cover that here in just a second. So incredibly grateful for our, all of our amazing sponsors. And so I'm actually going to do something a little bit different today. You're used to me plugging a certain company or, or somebody who's sponsoring. So I actually want to take a minute and just explain to you the different sponsorship opportunities that do exist. And I'm going to throw my email up here so you don't miss it. But so, Again, if you have any sponsorship uh, inquiries, feel free to drop me a line, podcast at boldmedia.us. But there are different opportunities. I'm only showing you a very small amount of the different ways that that you benefit as a sponsor. And so if you're curious about sponsorship, there's a couple of different ways that we can do it, whether it's a pre-roll ad, so something that's baked into like that intro video, and maybe we do a, you know, this episode sponsored by dot, dot, dot. And so we maybe do a quick little spot for you there on, on the front end. We always, we obviously have the mid-roll what's really cool about that though is it's baked into the show so as, as you see like i'm doing this live like this is all this is all all in one take so this ad will be baked into this episode forever there's no going back and dynamically 
pulling ads and re and reinserting them in, in, into some into some other show. So once once you got it, it's yours, which is which is really really cool. And then of course we're we're developing a subscribers list for in terms of email, so like the newsletter for the podcast, getting your name out there as we start to feature different guests and different different interviews and different information that's available to you. So there's a lot more than that, than what you're just seeing right now initially. And so again, if you'd like more information, we can have a much longer conversation about this, but drop me a line, podcast at boldmedia.us. I would love to help you grow your business and, and get your name out there on DFW's premier business business show, business podcast. So this is a great, great place to do this. And so anyway, I'm incredibly thankful for you for stick, sticking around and for listening. And I just want to jump right back into it. So so Matt, let's let's do that. So take us through a little bit of the journey of a dollar, right? So, you know, I'm I'm going to go pay my like my city water bill, which I have like on auto pay, but I, I and that may not be the best example, but take us through an example of of how all these different parts and pieces are interacting behind the scenes from from me to the bank account of whoever I'm paying. Sure, I think the there there's the, the there's a couple of examples, but I think the the one that's sort of most prevalent nowadays is like DoorDash, right? Okay. Um, so if you if you have a DoorDash account you are you probably have a payment method tied to that DoorDash account. So I mean it could be a credit card, it could be PayPal, it could be could be your Venmo account. Um, it could be it could be a bank account potentially. I, I don't know if they actually accept just sort of bank accounts uh, as a draft. But when you are when you authorize a transaction through DoorDash, they're get they're they're going to your bank and saying, does he have this money? Yes, put a hold on it. But that cash doesn't actually get to DoorDash probably until two days later. Um, so everything is still delayed behind the scenes, but at, at the at the very least, what DoorDash has done is they've authorized that we're gonna we're gonna get Aaron's money, so we feel confident we're gonna get it in a couple of days. Um, so let's go ahead and proceed with the order. What DoorDash does is DoorDash is gonna then go find a driver um, to go pick up your order. They have to pay the restaurant, so they you know they don't they're not they're not tied directly into the restaurant system. All they do is they pull up menus and they do have uh, sort of technology to, you know, something's out of stock or something like that. But sure. for the, for the most part, what they're, what they're actually doing is that driver has a prepaid card. In most cases, this is sort of how it would work. That driver has a, a DoorDash prepaid card that has nothing on it um, until they show up at, we'll, we'll say, we'll say they're going to, I don't know, like Fernando's or something for, for Mexican food. They're going to pick up the Mexican food. As soon as they get to that restaurant, what DoorDash does is they say, well, Aaron has $50 worth that he's buying. Let's enable a transaction on that card that that DoorDash guy has to be swiped at Fernando's and authorize it for $50, even though there's there's actually nothing on it. They're going to, they're going to authorize very specifically from that merchant for that specific amount at that time frame. And they'll even geolocate that person's phone to make sure they're actually standing where they're supposed to be standing. Dang. They'll authorize the transaction that they actually are then. So then Fernando's is doing the exact same thing they did. They're going to get an authorization, know that they're going to get the money at some point. They're not going to, they don't have it yet, but then they give them the food and then the driver goes off and, and gives it to you. So then over the next two days, they're getting asked from their merchant acquirer, DoorDash, to, to send money to Fernando's. And at the same time, your bank is being asked to send money to DoorDash. And most likely that's all gonna net settle, you know, over a, a period of time that it looks like, you know, nobody nobody even really holds it in transit. It just ends up at Fernando's minus the fees along the way that, that the people are getting. So DoorDash is fronting money for you, fronting money to the driver, fronting money to, to Fernando's, you know, before they even get it from you. Um, and the, the, the actual liquidity that's moving behind the scenes is far beyond, far behind the the technical connection between the merchant and the buyer. You know, younger folks think, you know, I have a PayPal, I have a Venmo, that it's just instant. I'm I'm sending you money instantly. Well, there's just a, a record of it, so it looks like you have it, but the money behind the scenes still is in banking systems, and it takes days to move that stuff. It's it's still arcane in many ways. I don't know. Wow. Did that make sense? Well, I that, yeah, that made that made total sense, and it's it's fascinating to realize that none of that is actually happening in real time. Like, there's, it's all like these little, I don't know if this is the right, good verbiage, but like like little micro loans. Like they're like they're pre they're prepaying these things for you. They're they're validating that there's that they're that funds do exist, right? They're not drawing from a from a zeroed out balance in an account, otherwise it'd get denied. 
but they see like, okay, this makes sense. But what was most fascinating to me was when you're saying like how you know, they are authorizing that card at the point of sale for a specific, you know, at a specific time, a specific location. Yep. And that, that's, that's mind blowing right there. So, it's, so, you know, yeah, the advancements around that stuff in the last couple of years has just been, and it, and it preceded a lot of the, the pandemic stuff that sort of has really put a strain on that, on that business model. But these pieces were already in place. So they were able to scale pretty rapidly. And, and now they don't even give you a card. The driver, the driver doesn't need, even need a physical card. The driver okay. can just have uh, the driver app on their phone and just tap and just, ha it's a vert. It looks like a, it looks like an Apple pay transaction to Fernando's. They don't even know that there's not an actual real piece of plastic behind the scenes. So they're, they're spinning up individual virtual account numbers for every single purchase like how? for, you know, it allows you to reconcile easily and off obviously it limits fraud. I mean, these drivers, you know, previously, you know, I, I delivered pizzas and, and, you know, my first, first year of college and, you know, you got cash. I mean, you're picking up cash and you're driving around. So if, if we were using that kind of a model today and every single one of these drivers had cash and money on hand and they had to then pay back to whoever it is they're working for, I mean, it, it, the, the losses would mount. And so that's why these, these things are built. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, that's a really cool example. So sp speaking, speaking of cash, so you know, DoorDash or Fernando's, I'm waiting for my check now too, because that was that was not sponsored. No, it's all good, man. All right, I'm sorry about that. I should have gone, should have gone some no, no, no names, but no, 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 no. I it was it was a it was a it was a poor attempt at a at a at a funny joke. It's all good. No, I was gonna. We'll, we'll move this back about about 14 minutes to where you were doing your spot, and then we'll, no. we'll get it in there. We'll no, no, <laughs> no, it's all good. No, it's, it, it, it's a great example. Well, one, I mean, that's, it's a service that a lot of people use, right? So, I mean, that's, it's a great, it's a great example of how Uber's another Uber as Uber yep. evolved, Uber and Lyft, know, Uber and Lyft. It makes it easy for us to hail, hail rides, obviously. And, and I don't, I just get out of the car and leave because everything just happens because my card is there, but that Uber driver, how do they actually get their share of that money? Right. You, 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 so you've got, you know, we're paying Uber. My, on my credit card, it says I paid Uber, but Uber then is fronting the money from my payment and giving whatever portion is owed to the driver in, in some cases immediately, same day as it's happening. So when I finish my shift and I've, you know, taken 10 people to the airport, I have my money. It's, yeah. I have it automatically in my, in my Uber prepaid card or Uber will just send it to my bank account. Um, so it's, that the sort of the I think it's the advancements I, I've said prepaid card several times here using these prepaid cards and these accounts to execute these kinds of commerce it's it's mind blowing there's, then there's more stuff happening it's really cool well but then like you said all that data though like so now you don't even need the cards because the card data is stored electronically now so it's like it right. takes it completely removes the the necessity to have a physical card now it's just it's all happening electronically through an app whether you you know like hey I, I'm going to tip this guy. X amount, you hit submit, and you can do this as you're walking into the airport terminal or wherever the heck you're going. And it's just, it happens real time. And that guy's able to cash out, you know, probably 30 minutes later of really whatever nice. happens. So it's, it's absolutely, absolutely nuts. So that's no, cool. So like, so take us on a little bit more of the journey. So you, you know, after you left Blackhawk, then looks like you're at MoneyGram and, and moving on from there. So MoneyGram here in Dallas, um, I know some people, uh, that, because I've been in Dallas for a while. I mean, they're headquartered here. So I know quite a few folks there. I had never been in the money transmitter remittance business before. Um, so that was a, that was an interesting sort of experience to try to, I had a, I had a, an international team. I, I owned part of the uh, part of the market in Asia pack and, and, and Europe. And it was sort of to, to learn how money moves globally and how li liquidity in each of those markets sort of makes the, makes the economics work for a company like MoneyGram. Um, and I, my charge was to, was to help us move into a digital delivery. So instead of okay. very uh, cash centric agents, walk in agents and, you know, hand off cash, and then somebody goes into an agent in another country and picks up the local fiat. This was about, this was about taking all that online and, and digitizing the experience. And um, I enjoyed my time there. I actually, I mean, I, I, I came back to Dallas and left Blackhawk because I, my, my son was turning 10 and, you know, I wanted to be home more. I was traveling all the time. All those acquisitions that we're doing at Blackhawk, I was just, I just, I lived on the road. So oh, 
Dallas being able to come back and, and just work downtown, you know, it made a made a big difference. So I mean, I enjoyed my time at MoneyGram, but but then the the entrepreneur bug called me again, and you know, we uh, we started this card now thing um, about a little year and a half after after I started MoneyGram. Yeah, so let's 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 dive into card now. So give give us a little bit of the, I mean, I, I know you shared with us a little bit earlier, but give give us an idea of like you know where the idea came from because it obviously you'd been kind of stewing on this for some time before you decided to move yep. forward with it. So like what what prompted you to actually go ahead and like you know what let's let's go for it you know start of 2020 which was uh which I I'm in I'm retrospect curious. I don't know you know <laughs> I'm curious, I'm curious that, that year. <laughs> yeah so take us a little bit on that story though. So yeah we um so uh, the the business I, I explained at Blackhawk with all these incentive platforms and um you know most larger enterprises will will partake in in those delivery models but but smaller businesses um sole props mom and pops maybe 20 employees or less they still want to reward their staff and they still want to offer incentives to clients and customers but they're too small really to sign up for for those bigger services and and they're not they're not looking for sort of the the the, the heavy weight that comes with some of those things. So sure. mo most likely what they do is they walk into uh, Walgreens or, or, or HEB and they, they, they're buying cards in bulk. And we found that while I was at Blackhawk, we found that there were transactions that would happen in retail that would be in, in increments of five, six, seven cards at a time. Um, and even if you take out the holidays, so we're trying to figure out you know, this in the billions of dollars of activity, who are these people? Why are they buying cards in bulk? And and they're, it's it's small businesses and real estate agents and doctors' offices and property managers and so we wanted to find a better way to serve that customer directly as opposed to them having to go into into retail um, and just get a handful of cards to hand out over some period of time. So sort of looking at that data and then sort of anecdotes about uh, you know my my mom would have. Uh, Sorry. you know, greeting I'm cards in a, in a, right in a shoe box, you know, and have a bunch of, always have a greeting card for whatever occasion. Well, convert that to gift cards and you know, everybody's got a junk drawer with gift cards in it. We have, yeah. you know, five or six GameStop cards, which you know, that's interesting uh, nowadays, but we have, you know, downstairs, my son used to go to birthday parties on, on the weekends. Yeah. Here's always have a card. So instead of n having customers not know the balance they have, what card is active, what, what, um, what card do I have on hand at any given time? We, we came up with a service where we give a, a box of inactive inventory uh, to a customer that they can keep at their office or keep at their house and a mobile app. And so you're, you're essentially buying the card as you need it just from your own personal inventory. Take it out of the, take it out of the box, scan the card, tell me how much you want to load on it. And then you're able to hand it to whoever you're going to hand it to or put it in the box or put it in the envelope. Or, um, so we have all, all the top retailer brands that that are supported and That's so cool. um, we're we started in Irving fulfilling sort of you know ourselves with uh, dead plastic and sort of putting them in boxes and stuff and uh, but I ended up finally partnering with somebody up in the Chicago area that's doing it for me now but um, there's there's lots of little niches of of small business owners and markets that that really benefit from having these cards on hand so now pandemic changes you know maybe the sort of the frequency and the velocity of, of some of these face-to-face -face interactions sure and then there's there's this non-stop you know push to push everything digital and e-gift but there are you know retail gift card sales still year over year are increasing even though it's a small number it's i mean a small percentage it's a big number uh people still want something tangible you can't yeah. you know we, we we move so quickly from wrapping up a gift and giving it to someone to then move to a gift card. I don't know how quickly we're going to move to just, you know, if I send my mom $20 in Venmo, I mean, that, that's, that's completely ridiculous. We, I still need to take advantage of the little bit of personalization we have left, which is put some thought into a card and hand yeah. it to somebody physically and, and say, thank you or, or kudos or whatever it is. So. No, that's cool. Yeah. I was, I was on your website earlier and I, and I remember cause I was, I was pulling up the, uh, couple of the articles that were on your website. So, I mean, one, it's a, it's a great website, but two, like I like the box um, and uh, like the starter boxes. Right. So like you've yeah. got these, these things where people can like literally get, get a box of cards from different, 
from different places. And now they've got this, they got this inventory now, but what you're saying though, is they're, they're not already preloaded. So you didn't have to walk into Kroger or wherever and go or, and go buy a thousand dollars worth of gift cards today. Is that, it, that, that's not that's, happening a, on this platform. Correct. Right. It's a, it's a cash flow benefit, right? I'm not locking up capital yep. as a, as a small business owner, you know, putting a thousand dollars into a bunch of gift cards that, that, that could be a problem. Why, why would right. I do that? So by having sort of the, that, that rack, on the end cap at target just shrunk down in you know and put it on your on, on, on your receptionist desk or in the drawer you you have the ability and the flexibility to to always have a card whenever you need it and you'll buy it and load the exact amount you need uh, when you're actually gonna where you're gonna hand it out or give it to whoever you're giving it to that's pretty awesome so like i mean how's 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 the market received it like how's that how, how has I, you know going? last year last year was was a tough year to try to get something off the ground, but I'm I'm very happy with, with, with what we were able to accomplish. I think we 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 turned what were some lofty projections into sort of more of a proof of concept uh, objective for last year, uh, into making sure that the tech was solid, the fulfillment was solid, um, the the user experience and the app and and how how the features tied together. Now you could order more cards and add, add brands and. Um, all of the pieces work really well. We were able to get lots of different verticals and industries uh, signed up and using the service of so real estates, uh, agencies and doctor's offices. And uh, I've got some home health care uh, franchise operations that, that, that put a box in every single office. And wow. um, so we, we found lots of really good pockets of success. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleased with what we were able to do. I think that this year is is about sort of doubling down on a couple of the the, the b2b channels that um you know it's just it's taken a while to to get their attention yeah. um but I'm, I'm we're well well on our way with sort of delivering this into other channels as a part of a service that's already being offered as a part of a small business solution or something as a part of expense management software or accounting software for a small business um and then and then maybe even in retail you know there's there's there's, it's a it's a different model, so it's going to take some education. But uh, pandemic sort of shone a light on you know that's the beauty, the beauty of adversity. There's always an opportunity, right? So yeah. pandemic is is wildly uh, sort of muting a, a lot of opportunities that we had originally thought about. But uh, you can't when you go to a store to pick up groceries and you order a curbside pick it, you can't do gift cards. Um, you know, HEB won't do that. Kroger won't do that because it's it's a fraud. They, they don't want to have cards activated at a POS and then walk out and put them in a bag. You know, they're not set up that way. The, when they do their, when they pick and pack for some curbside, yeah. they're not running through a POS. You know, they're just getting an order. And, and so this is a great model for for grocery that that has people wanting to get cards in, in, the, in the drive up. All right, well, let's give them a box, and then that could create a, a regular relationship for HEB for that customer. And um, so that's the kind of stuff I'm really trying to push into to get some of those relationships. Yeah, to take advantage of what I think is a, a better mousetrap for 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 that customer experience, where you know today they would lose the gift card sale altogether. So right, yeah, I mean that's that's a great that's a great point because yeah, you 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 have to physically go into the store and more. And I, I don't know the numbers, but somebody can send them to me, I'm sure. But like more and more sales are occurring online. So like the curbside pickup is now a very dominating means of you doing you know groceries and doing you know like. I mean, shoot, just ordering stuff off of Amazon, right? Like yep. there's there's a lot of things that are, that's occurring exclusively online minus like crap. I need to get like, you know, a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk. Like you're going to jump up to the store. But to your point, though, I mean, you're, there's, there's a lot of foot traffic that's being missed. And so now you're kind of it, it's clever because you could package it. At, you know, as it, as it's because I mean, there's there's nothing that has to be activated. It just leaves the store, right? So they're just it's it's like buying uh, you know just a, a couple greeting cards is what it sort of yeah. ends up being. You know, I mean, it's we, we charge twelve ninety nine for it. You know, for the for the first box, and then you don't pay anything else. That's you just amazing. you just pay what you load on the cards. Um, so wow. yeah, there's a there is definitely a, a a market in that model that I just described, and and you're trying to find the way to insert it into the existing delivery models and the, the existing vendors that are there. But, but I think, I think we'll figure it out. Yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, cause I'm thinking all the different applications you can have for this, you know, outside of 
like a lot of the standard stores and things like that. But even like, I don't know, this could sound ridiculously you know, stupid, but I mean, even like sports teams, is there a way to like, you know, license that with like, you know, professional sports and you're prepaying for tickets to go somewhere or, yeah, as, as some type of gifting option. I mean, like there's, there's a lot of different ways that that could go. And like, that's, it, that's a it's great a pretty, idea. yeah, like it's, that. it's a pretty neat, neat thing to do. You know, like you're, you're able to keep it personal and, and, but you limit your expenses and keep things, keep things close. So no, I think it's a great, it's a great concept. It's a great, I mean, it's a beautiful website, really, really like really well laid out in terms of just understanding exactly what's going on from, I've got some great, I've got some great people that, that help me with all that. I mean, I'm, you know, absolutely some very creative folks that, that do a lot of that. So I'm, I'm thankful to have them on the team. So like, let's talk like the, maybe potentially like the ugly side of this. So is there, is there anything to prevent somebody from trying to jump in and beat you to this? Cause I feel like this is going to be a, like a bit of a marketing play. Like you've got to like, you know, who's got more marketing budget, <laughs> you know, to be able to certainly, get that out there. Certainly. I think, um, the technology is pretty unique. What we've, okay. So I would say that the pieces have always, I've always existed, but nobody's put them together in this sequence in a way that allows the, the individual consumer to sort of interact with them. Like this is what we were talking about earlier. Most of the most of the most of the things I'm using are typically behind the scenes guts that aren't exposed in an app, like we've done. Um, so we put things together in a unique way, and I filed a patent on it. You know, I mean, I think that that was the awesome. first thing we did when we first before awesome. before we even finished raising money, and we just had just barely got the incorporation done. We had we had it written, and we we submitted, and, and I feel like it's uh, this is unique enough that the process patent should hold. And at the very least it, it, it will, it will allow us to have really good conversations with people as partners, as opposed to trying to compete. Um, and I'm more than willing to license it and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think it's, a, I, I think it's a clever way to keep the personal touch. Cause like to your point, right? Like I was, I was starting to laugh because I'm like, yeah, we, I mean, how sad have we become now where it's like, you know, everything, I mean, I, I hate to think that we would ever descend into it. And, and I'm not trying to call you out out there. Like, so if anybody who's listening, watching, talking to you right now, I'm not, I'm not trying to put you down, but I'm just thinking, you know, the, the less and less personal we become, that's just, it's that just painful. Like I, I would, I would hate to be at a point where we're just, we're just wiring money, you know, from bank account to bank account for Christmas or birthdays like that. Just, but, yeah. you know, we, we, we're starved for, I mean, I think we're, we're so starved for more contact and personal nowadays. Yeah. And, and we, people are finding really you know, the drive through birthday thing. When that started, that blew me away that people were doing that in their neighborhoods and people would, you know, sit in their front yard for yeah. Sally's birthday and people would drive by because people don't want things to be just electronic and email. They yeah. want, per, so I think we'll always have, there'll always be a demand for it. I, I just got to make sure that I'm, I'm in front of that and, yeah. and I'm, and I'm talking to that customer when they're making that decision. Yeah. I'm just thinking like, you know what, what if we get to the point where it's like virtual Christmas presents around the tree, you know, they're all, you know, it's all holograms and you touch, you touch the hologram and it I mean, unwraps again. <laughs> I don't want to zoom with my parents over Christmas again. I don't even right. want to do that. So I don't, you know, yeah. the, it's uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully things bounce back and, and we're, and we sort of overcorrect the other direction and then that'll be good for car down. So. You know, so you, you mentioned raising money. So you, so you, so this is backed by, you know, capital raising. So if, if you don't mind, we don't have to go into like, sure. excruciating detail, but like share, share with those that are curious about the capital raising side of, of getting a business going. Like, what was that experience like for you? Like what, what advice did you have for others that maybe have never gone through that before? So, you know, lucky enough to have uh, a previous company that we we exited. So we had some some investors that that were a part of that that we were okay. able to to bring back in. But um, we did mostly friends and family, mostly people that are that are in the business. And you you're selling yourself. You know, you're going to be passionate about an idea, um, and you're going to be able to put a deck together. And, and but but at the end of the day, you're you're going to know more about that than than that person is whoever you're asking for money, and they're really going to be investing in you. Uh, because like we're a p perfect case that what I had in that deck did not happen um, because last year was very different than we originally walked in expecting it to be. So they invested in in me and my ability to sort of react and overcome. Uh, so you're selling yourself, you got to have a great idea, certainly. Uh, but as, as long as when you're starting small and it's going to be small investments, 
by a lot of folks. Uh, there's different ways to structure those things. Um, we sort of raise as you need. There's the safe structures, and but we did a, a straight LLC, and and we had I think 20 different investors, varying amounts. Uh, we didn't raise a ton of money. It was really about getting it started, um, and so now I'm in the process of looking for looking for more for round two, um, oh. sort of in conjunction with this, you know, ex expansion. And so a lot of the partners that that would be interesting partners for distribution are also folks that you know, potentially be investors. And so that that's how that those conversations are, are just ongoing constantly now. So. Sure. Well, I mean, and, and it makes sense, too, because I mean, you you have a track record of success. You've done like you've, you've had a lot of experience in this industry. So naturally, you know, you, you're like I'm not going to use this archaic term Rolodex, but your uh, your your network, your network of people are very heavily concentrated in this industry. So, you know, as you kind of alluded to earlier, it seems like a lot of folks that work in the space tend to know each other if they've been around for some length of time so you know, you've you've built a bit of a reputation you know the things that you've worked on have gone well so it's it's positioned you in a point where people can't they they, they can invest in you and i think that's a brilliant point is and, I, and i've heard this from from a few different people is like when investors are looking at in an opportunity to, to your point obviously it's got to be a good idea Obviously, there's a lot of things about it that need to just make sense from it from an investor standpoint. But at the at the end of the day, though, they are they are investing in you. So right. you know, do they think you can deliver? Do they think that you're able to? Or are you are you the person for the task? And can you take us from point A to you know the vision of where it's going to be on slide seven? You know, so it's like, how's this all going to you know how how's this all going to go down? You know, so. No, I, I, it's it's fantastic. I'm 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 excited for you. I'm I'm curious to see like how it how it continues to grow for you. And I think there's it, it's I, I think you're scratching you're definitely scratching an itch that I think is you're 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 serving a group of people that I think really need to be served. And so I think I, I really do think there's an opportunity there. And and I think as you continue to go out, you're going to see a, a whole bunch of different use cases for yep. ways that it could be used. So anyway, yep. Um, well, no, you know, like, it'll be a fun year. It's going to be a fun year. I think it'll yeah, be a fun year. So. Yeah. No, I mean, it's hard to believe, you know, it, it's like, it's here we are. It, yeah. It, I, yeah. I mean, like we're at the end of Q1, mm -hmm. you know, like we're starting to wind down already Q1. So it's, it's just, it's absolutely, absolutely nuts. But no, I mean, as we, as we wind down, man, I just want to really, I think I've at this point, probably most appropriate, just kind of turn this last segment back over to you. But like, is there, is there anything that we haven't gotten to in terms of that you that you've kind of got on your chest that you'd like to share or any, any parting shots, words of wisdom for those that are in their professional careers, looking to make a change or looking to start an idea. Like if there's anything we haven't had time, we haven't addressed yet. I'd love to kind of give this back to you in terms of just final, final words. Well, I mean, I, I think um, most of the conversations that I have with, uh, with entrepreneurs, you know, last year is just a great microcosm of, of, how you have to be prepared to uh, to change direction and you know pivoting is an overused word um but and, and also because i think it, i think pivoting also sort of implies uh a, a, a pretty dramatic shift and you, i'm i've always found that you just need to be flexible enough to make small changes you know but but maybe maybe you end up making a lot of small changes but, it, but the, you don't need to to turn the tanker all the way around. You just need to steer it a little bit one direction or the other. And so having a team of people that are comfortable with change, uh, having a culture that's comfortable with change. And again, not, you know, we're selling widgets today. I'm selling cars tomorrow. It's, but, but at least comfortable with, you know, what we wrote down two weeks ago, it's going to be a little different, you know, because that it takes, it takes a, a, a group of folks that are happy in that environment to make that successful because you're going to end up with folks that are, that aren't necessarily as comfortable with, with that kind of, that kind of environment. So it's a culture thing, you know, yeah. so a culture that's comfortable to change is going to be the best starting point for, for any entrepreneur. No, that's solid. Cause you, I mean, you've got to always be adaptive and, and able to respond to different things that you learn. Cause you're always learning, especially, especially like in your, in your case or really in any business that, is is addressing a, a a new market, so to speak. You're you're going to learn a lot of things along the way, and you got to be able to respond to that as you gain more information and as you are able to observe 
the way things are being received or yep. responded to. Right. So it's like it, you're able to kind of go through that. So no, I think it's, I think it's solid. I appreciate, appreciate you sharing that. And really, I just, I just want to thank you again for, for being here. I've really, I've really thoroughly enjoyed our, uh, our, our conversation. How, how can people get in touch with you? What's the, what's the easiest way for them to uh, follow what it is that you're doing? So I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, you know, and, and I'm posting stuff all the time there and, you know, blogs and uh, sort of co-author a bunch of uh, articles around payments in general. So I'd love to follow me on, on there and, and, you know, cardnow.com, please check it out and let me know what you think. You can, uh, you can email me directly at matt.fry at cardnow.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Matt, again, I just, I just want to thank you. This has been a, it's been a true blast. I really appreciate you spending some time with nice me. Nice talking today. to you, Aaron. Nice talking to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. 